Life Insurance Corporation's LIC shares listed on the bourses at a discount to their issue price on Tuesday. The stock fell nearly 5% more within the first hour of trading and closed at 9% discount to the issue price. While the LIC listing has been a disappointment, the government will track the first quarter performance to decide the future course of divestment. The changes to other insurance sector players will depend on LIC's fortunes. Good morning, my name is Ishan Gera and you're watching the Business Standard Banking Show. In today's episode, we'll cover the important developments of the week, including India's rising gold reserves. We have an interview lined up with Sham Srinivasan, Federal Bank MD and CEO. Our Banking for You section explains the RBI's Prompt Corrective Action Framework. In our Take Two section, we have Business Standard Consulting Editor and Banking Sector Expert Tamil Bandhupadhyay explaining the NPA situation in the country. Here are the developments of the week. On May 16th, India's largest public sector bank, State Bank of India, hiked the marginal cost of lending rate by 10 basis points across 10 years. This was the second hike by the PSP in a month, and it is expected to increase the EMIs further. But while EMIs are going up on one hand, so are rates on saving instruments. PNB, ICICI Bank, Axis, HDFC Bank and others raised rates on fixed deposits. With another hike on the anvil, it remains to be seen how fast such pass-throughs will work. For a regular saver, interest rates are rising, but data released by RBI last week showed that central bank was piling on its gold reserves. According to RBI, the gold reserves were up by 100 tons in two years. Meanwhile, as a proportion of total reserves, gold accounted for 7% of total forex reserves, the highest in last eight years. The share is only expected to go up if RBI will have to intervene in the market to stabilize the rupee. On Tuesday, the rupee touched an all-time low of 77.69 rupees per dollar. Talking of interventions, the government last week announced it would soon restructure its top head hunting body, the Bank's Board Bureau, as its extended two-year term ended last month. The BBB is responsible for appointment of full-time directors and non-executive chairpersons of PSBs and state-owned financial institutions. It also helps banks formulate growth strategies. One of the reasons for setting up of the BBB was to address instances of rising defaults and frauds in the banking system. However, as the situation is improving and most banks are coming up out of the slump, at least for now, the instances of fraud are also declining. Data released by RBI showed that public sector banks reported a 51% drop in the amount involved in frauds to 40,295 crore rupees in FY22, compared with 81,922 crore rupees in FY21. The number of fraud cases declined from 9,993 to 7,940 according to a reply to an RTI by the central bank. From public sector banks, let's now move on to private ones. The healthy recovery and profitable balance sheets show that most banks have weathered the pandemic storm well. Business Standard's Raghu Mohan had a conversation with Sham Srinivasan, MD and CEO of Federal Bank, to discuss the pandemic's after effects and the bank's digital push. to have you on the BS Banking Show. Now, my first question is that if you go by the results of all banks in recent times, it seems to suggest the worst may be over behind us, the after effects of the pandemic. What's the sense, what is the sense that you are getting from the banking sector? Uh, firstly, thank you, Raghu. Uh, happy to be on the show. Yes, it is uh, quite encouraging to see results across the spectrum. As of now, I think all the large uh, private sector banks have, public sector banks haven't yet come out. But I think the trend line is very clear. Um, what most of us feared would be the consequence of the pandemic on the credit quality of banks. Happily and thankfully, that looks quite robust, uh, which indicates that both the portfolio and the cleaning up that was done years ago has held well. Second, the very many regulatory interventions that came in to support customers through this period have also worked well. So at this point in time, uh, my view is most of us have both provided well 
and dealt with the pandemic. So have customers uh, been able to keep their record okay? Uh, here on, I think the situation will be different, not pandemic-led uh, challenges, but what's going to happen in the economy and where things are shaping up. But on balance, uh, at this juncture, most of us have come out fairly unscathed with good quality provisioning and good quality portfolios. And that speaks to fair amount of work across years. It doesn't happen here, as you know better than me. Credit quality is not a, you don't build it one year, right? You build it across a period of time. You see, in the last three years, one variable which held in favor of the industry was the industry it was pretty soft. Now that we are going in for a switchover, that's a new variable in the equation. So how do you crystal gaze? No, I think that uh, the consequence of a rate increase has to be seen through two, three lens, right? One is, it obviously means money is more expensive. Borrowing will become more expensive, but so will return on people's deposits. So as long as that real rate doesn't wildly fluctuate, then you can cope with challenges. And again, if the rate increase is an unprecedented, unabated, continuous growth, there are one set of actions. And if it is a, you know, sort of a correction leading up to a rate increase and it stabilizes at that level and growth uh, growth happens, then I think cost for worry is less. So the jury is on kind of GDP growth that we will face in the period ahead. If we have come out of the trough and COVID related challenges are hopefully behind us. And you know, of course the wild card is the uh, Russia Ukraine situation. But if you have to discount for that and believe that that will more or less stabilize, then I do see a rate increase per se doesn't mean you know, bad news. What it means is that you have to readjust yourself to a higher level on both sides. And in the near term, when there's a rate increase, just when there's a rate fall, the rate uh, borrowing rates for customers comes down for, uh, graded, but cost of money is different. So I think in this period of time, you'll see lending rates going up, uh, deposit rates trailing. So the near term, banks will benefit from the rate increase period. And again, we have to see, it. is it a sustained rate increase or does it start plateauing at some point in time? I think all of us are factored in the repo rate to go up by another 50, 60 basis points over the next 12 months and de designing, developing our plans around that. As long as the industry investments keep happening, which I'm hoping will spur GDP growth, will start seeing traction as we go into calendar 22, a lot will be relatively sanguine. Can you, give, can you give a sense of the split up between the corporate and retail book in your case? Uh, about three years back, we had guided that we would keep our retail. Uh, when I say retail, I mean all exposures, say below five crores at about 55% of the book and above that at about 45% of the book. And as we speak today, we are really at that point, 55, 45 retail wholesale. Now within retail and wholesale, depends on the opportunity and the situation and the margin. Now, if the stress were to continue, do you see yourself going a bit easy on the retail front, given the embedded perils in it? See, again, I go back to the earlier points I mentioned in terms of what is driving the stress as we see it. Is it a sustained job loss, economic downturn related stress? Then certainly things will be different. But if we are seeing GDP growth happening, but at an elevated cost, then it is not as it's not a bad news situation. So I think we have to be uh, calibrating our plans to how things are shaping out in the economy. My own sense is the em emergence of credit bureaus, the uh, the the various economic uh, ecosystem developments that have happened in Chandan, Aadhaar, mobile, digital. Uh, a, a bunch of stuff that is happening. Nobody wants a bad credit history. Even a startup, a young uh, executive or a young borrower doesn't want to see his records card, which is one very major development from what even 10 years back, right? All of us have seen the industry over the last 30, 40 years. I think the biggest development that has happened, particularly after the emergence of the Bureau and the technologization, so to say, we've seen uh, the eagerness, keenness to have a 
a scratch free credit record is very high i mean if for any reason somebody sees you know one payment missed you can see them scampering all around to some of you know make sure that their record doesn't uh, take them to a score lower than say 700 or 720 or 730 so i think people have become highly sensitive about bureau scores and because it impairs career borrowing record across time is very hard to reset your record once it goes bad so my view is it won't get as adverse yes there may be some sectors of the market which may see near term pressure pressure uh, but it's certainly not which is why even through the pandemic you didn't see dramatic deterioration in credit right it may slow down credit growth but it will not see deterioration in credit quality last year you said simple digital contactless will be the cornerstone of your strategy how do you see this shaping up oh yeah i mean that's a mantra we've been living to ragu thanks for pointing it out yes uh, you know the mantra at the bank is digital at the fore human at the core so everything we do should have both the elements addressed and to make that happen is really why we chose simple digital contactless contactless became even more uh, important in the pandemic because the need for physical you know ability to connect was way lower so all you know i can go on rattle around a few developments that we did uh, you know all our products and offerings have been designed around that uh, whether you're talking of fedi which is our sort of chat bot which you today can virtually do almost all of your banking requirements and all through click on your device we've developed designed uh, all three principles being in place not only just for the outside if i turn my pan my camera you will not see a single paper on my desk mm-hmm. and it's not just because i'm doing an interview with you i don't see paper at all i stop totally everything is digital so my office is wherever i go wherever is you know is a uh, location that i am is the office because the device is in your hand all that we want to do we do a uh, board meetings have become digital of course man pandemic uh, initiated it so we've tried to digitalize so to say how do you see the run rate on branches shaping up um you know f- about 6 years back uh, ragu we chose the mantra of branch light distribution heavy basically making um, you know we had you know i've been in this job for a fair bit of years the first four five years we doubled our network and then we said we must get our branches very productive before we run into developing more branches in the interim spend spend our money on digital so that we increase our distribution that's why we came with branch light distribution heavy so in the last five and a half years we added only 25 30 branches but we d- more than doubled our business because we use digital rms feet on street making our current branches more productive my last question to you the government has put forward a plan for dg banks how do how do you propose to utilize this window i think it's same you know it speaks to the same theme around uh, ensuring self service ensuring that capabilities for customers across the spectrum across geographies um, are uh, heavily intuitively self usable right i mean you don't want to create a digital cap- capability which is uh, which is intimidating you want it to be extremely uh, intuitive and friendly for the end user which is often in vernacular so i think this digital banking unit we we have what we call fed studios fedi studios we have nine of that already across the country uh, we see uh, the digital banking units that are being recommended now quite akin to that which is like completely self service 24 by 7 do it when you want where you want how you want but in the confines of a branch environment or branch like environment the fedi studio which we have you know we have in mumbai we have in chennai we have in calcutta we have in kochi we have in bangalore and we have a few more lined up these will be exactly what we are looking at is self service virtually everything that a customer wants to do can be done uh, and it can be in hopefully which you are working on is vernacular and doesn't need a user manual to use that's broadly the point i mean to make it too intimidating then the idea is lost today the universalization of atm which has taken many years has been because it's very simple to use so the digital studios should be that and which is what we are working on and we are more than happy to participate and you know do our bit but at scale we will do that in a very large way so sham it was nice talking to you as usual thank you for your wonderful insights hope to catch up with you soon thank Have you sir day. Srinivasan believes banks digital capability should not be intimidating they should be intuitive and user friendly and often in vernacular he also told business standard that the consequence of the pandemic on credit quality of banks looks robust 
How does the RBI ensure this robustness? The central bank had introduced a prompt corrective action framework to monitor the health of banks and place restrictions. In 2021, it announced that it shall be bring NBFCs under PCA. Let's understand what PCA is and when it kicks in. Public sector lender Central Bank of India will finally come out of the Reserve Bank of India's Prompt Corrective Action or PCA framework. And with this, all state-run banks will be out of the PCA. That implies there will be no curbs placed on them as they go about doing their business. So what is PCA? Prompt corrective action is enforced by the banking regulator when banks show signs of stress. While this is painful, the idea is to improve the health of banks in the long term. It also ensures that depositors' faith in the banking system is not eroded, even as it forces banks to clean up their books. There are four thresholds for RBI's prompt corrective action. The first, capital adequacy ratio. This is an indicator of how much capital a bank has by way of cushion to absorb the impact of stress on its books. The danger sign is when a bank's capital adequacy ratio falls by more than 250 basis points. The second, net non-performing assets or net NPAs. This threshold kicks in when the net NPAs of a bank cross the 6% mark. The third, profitability. This threshold is when a bank reports two consecutive years of negative returns on its assets. The fourth, leverage. This comes into play when the total leverage crosses 25 times the tier one capital. Under the PCA, the RBI imposes restrictions on the quantum of dividend distribution and repatriation of profits in the case of foreign banks. Promoters of the banks have to shore up the capital base. It also leads to restrictions on the domestic and overseas branch expansion of the bank under PCA. The RBI also curbs pay hikes, directors' fees, promotions, and recruitment of the bank. In effect, the PCA allows the RBI to clean up the NPA mess in the banking system. I am the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. One of the conditions for PCA to kick in was the high rate of NPAs for a bank. In his column in Business Standard this week, Tamil Bandhupadhyay tracked the country's business cycle-like phase of NPAs. He also raised questions on the regulatory forbearance window. Let's listen into his views in more detail. Hi, Tamil. Thanks for coming on the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you. In its last report, the RBI had raised the possibility of NPAs rising again. In your column, where you highlight Rakesh Mohan and Partha Ray's paper, there's a kind of a business cycle-like scenario of NPAs in India. Can you describe this journey or the three phases for our viewers? Uh, no, yeah, let's let's uh, let's cut into two what is currently happening and my column. My column actually is a historical perspective. And that's not my opinion. It's uh, uh, the duo, former Reserve Bank of India Deputy Governor Rakesh Mohan and NIBM Director Parth Ray. Uh, they tracked down the NPAs from the 90s, you know, uh, uh, when Reserve Bank of India first started uh, the asset uh, recognition norm first and how it evolved, uh, etc. And then, of course, it, it did uh, the three phases, how the 90s were very high. And then we started going down. Uh, you know, in the first uh, first decade, it was actually going down. Even post Lehman 2011-12, it was it was going down. And then uh, from 2014 onwards, till 2018, those four years, we saw uh, much much higher incidence. I mean, to talk about certain banks, like I remember individually, which is not mentioned in the copy, like Uco Bank or for that matter, Indian mm -hmm. Overseas Bank, almost one third of the bank total assets was gross in place. Yeah. And they also dissected or uh, tried to take a look at it. What are the reasons behind it? Now, there are multiple reasons, of course. 
for the first time somebody won Reserve Bank of India and Deputy Governor is writing, and he is he is actually <laughs> saying that not saying so, but RBI is the villain. That's the kind of thing, yeah. and he is referring to Reserve Bank of India. Is, um, uh, restructuring window or the four BRLs which happened in 2008. Uh, there's a correction here. In fact, as we speak, half an hour back, Dr. Y.V. Reddy called me uh, reacting to the column. He said, Kamal, it's fine. But you have spoken about in August 2008. It's actually not August 2008. Uh, this was this was rectified or changed in December 2008. Okay. So you know, uh, August two thousand eight was the was the uh, Doctor uh, Y B Reddy regime, which ended okay. just about a week before Lehman crisis and Subaru took it, and that's the beginning, which was for which was to end in a sh um, for a shorter period, which was to continue, but it continued for long, uh, for long, uh, almost a decade. Uh, uh, so that's the reason uh, uh, this duo of uh, Rakesh Mohan and Pathore. And blame Reserve Bank of India. Now, when we are talking about the regulatory forbearance coming to uh, continuing for a decade until 2018, uh, do you place that fault only at RBI's feet, or would you actually blame the government for trying to kickstart growth at that point of time and just holding the reins of it? No, it's as I said. Uh, of course, there was pressure from the government, but that was not. Uh, that's in the first half itself. In the second, uh, uh, second. Uh, term of the UK regime, there was banks under pressure uh, to, uh, to uh, quote unquote, because you can't prove it, uh, to lend and you know kickstart uh, the economy and infrastructure. But then there was uh, the so-called policy paralysis. Things were just not moving. So many court cases uh, related to land and other things, things were just not moving. And uh, so banks were happy, banks were hiding, banks were evergreening. And then the Rajan era came and Rajan said, look, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not done. In fact, he found out with his interaction from the corporate, with the corporate India that, look, if you are a corporate captain, um, you start your project, you bring your equity first on the table and then you go for debt. But, the, but what the bankers were doing at that point of sorry, what the corporate uh, CEOs and uh, corporate promoters were doing at this point of time, the both debt and equity were coming from the banks. You know, yeah. uh, the, it's a bank money. So which is what uh, the Rajan started the first of its kind, I think globally, AQR, Asset Quality Review. Even after Dr. Rajan left, his, uh, his uh, successor, uh, Dr. Patel, okay. was equally, uh, I would say, uh, stringent on that. And he went even one step ahead. And that led to, of course, to his exit on, on multiple issues. When I was reading the paper, I was skimming through it. I found that uh, there were a few other factors which you also po point out uh, that were mentioned in the paper besides the regulatory forbearance. Commodity prices were lower, PPP projects were failing, there was a governance failure. We are now in a phase where the government has promised large infra investments via the NIP. Uh, their cost of funds is set to rise and commodity prices are rising. So are we getting to, into a kind of a deja vu situation again? Uh, well, yes or no, because I think the context is very different now. Uh, if you see, had there been no COVID, uh, had you spoken, had, had we had this conversation two years back in 2020, beginning 2020, uh, things were just getting better and better because banks realized their mistakes. Uh, you know, the first phase of it, the recognition of NPAs were over. And the second phase, the recovery started. But remember, earlier we did not have IBA, uh, I mean IBC, the insolvency, yeah. insolvency law. Yeah. Now we had in record time, we put in IBC. Uh, IBC per se may not be a great success, but the threat of IBC, actually the fear of God now the, the corporate India has, you know, the fear of losing their empire. So things have changed. Banks are much more circumspect, much more, much more. I would say, uh, they use their discretion in, in giving money. Um, the first phase of recognition is over. Uh, recovery is on. It would have been far higher. Uh, had there been no COVID, um, and which is why the, uh, banks are actually over cautious, which is why you are seeing that uh, uh, the credit of tape of tickets not happening much. Problem is somewhere else. Um, uh, the, the restructuring which happened during the 
this time the restructuring happened, the forbearance. You know, Kamath Committee recommended, I think, 26 sectors um, uh, where they identified where the loan could be restructured. And my understanding is this, the kind of money they were thinking of 7 trillion plus need to be restructured, it was not that much. And then you have the government guaranteed scheme. Uh, MSME is a big pain because, yes. uh, you know, uh, because of while, while the large corporation could stomach it and the, the COVID issues, in fact, they flourished some of them. Yes. But then what happened, the MSMEs, many of them died. And what they needed is much more than equity. They needed uh, much more than debt. Uh, if you look at the March result the, from the December result also, and even before, the Indian banks, prima facie, looking at the numbers, had never been never had so good because their provision coverage ratio is going up. The NPAs are going down. Uh, they are making profit. And if I'm not mistaken, the fiscal year 2022 profit was a historic high, record high forever. I think it's too early to celebrate. We don't know what is in store, particularly in the MSME and other segment, the restructured loan, how much actually will turn back. Will the banks, do the banks know? Probably they know. Are they telling the truth? I, I, I would not call them the liar, but uh, you know, they're also evolved, they've seen as evolving. Now, two things I would like to point out um, on it to see, Ishan. One is this, don't look at NPA only. Look at NPA plus restructured loan. And then you see the amount of stress assets and uh, which bank is where. And other part is this, I would not name the banks, but some of the banks you will see those who are in the space of, including the ASFB small finance bank, who yes. are space of small loans, you will find there's a, Tremendous increase, average loan size. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it say? I, I, you were my customer. Uh, till six months back, average loan size for you was 100 rupees. Now it's become 150 rupees. So I presume I'm giving you more money to pay off your old loan. So yeah. this is one way of evergreening. Uh, you, I don't want to name the banks, but quite a few banks who have exposure in that MSME and SME and the small segment, they have done that. And it's all in public domain. Uh, look at the March quarter results. Yeah. You will find out there's a phenomenal increase in the average loan size. Nothing mm -hmm. can explain. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I refuse to believe that their borrower has suddenly become so much of business, they need so much more money and they are getting so much more money. So it is a way of evergreening. I'm sure Reserve Bank of India is taking note of it. So to in sum, banks are in the best of health. That's what the number says. Mr. Kamath says that he has not seen such a healthy bank in terms of provision, uh, making provision and the quality of assets in the past 50 years in his career. Uh, many of the credit rating agencies, including the Google agencies, uh, Moody's and SNPs, uh, yes. They have also spoken about that Indian bank in the best of health. But I personally feel that it's it's too early to celebrate. We need to wait. We need to wait for next uh, maybe 18 months to two years. How much of the restructure loan turn back and what? Uh, we've just talked about rates. So I'm circling back to rising rates. Right. Mm -hmm. and this is something that is of interest to everyone. Now, given the 7.8% inflation reading, what do you expect in the June policy review? Are we looking at rate hikes in quick succession one? Two, is it a prudent approach to go that fast? Of course, of course, we, we are. Uh, it, it, it is given that there'll be there'll be a hike. Now, whether they will go at a, at one go seventy five basis bips, uh, I would like I would like to think that no, we'll go slow. Um, I'm afraid. I mean, you may not like me seeing uh, saying this, but I think we were a little complacent. Uh, we were underestimating uh, the inflation threat. Uh, if you see the February inflation uh, projection and the change in April, and it will change in in uh, it again will change in June. I think yeah. we went into that uh, that phase where saying that we are better off than others. We also said that we have decoupled ourselves from the rest of the world, but you can't. We are probably we should have started uh, in February uh, in April, if not in February, uh, slow rate hike. Mm -hmm. I think we, we refuse to uh, accept the reality uh, that uh, 
probably they will split it 75 basis point if we carry uh, if you to look at the last rate hike we need another 75 basis point to go to pre covid level yes now we we'll, we we'll let the question is will you, will reserve bank of india will do it at one go in june or will it split it between june and august uh, going by reserve bank of india record uh, i would like to believe they will split it into two between june and uh, august mm -hmm. but then that's not the end it will go up uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean i would like to believe that uh, mr satyakant das's first three year was only rate cut and next three years only rate hike uh, thank you thanks a lot for your time it was great talking to you and we hope to have you back again soon thank you Thank you. Thank you. Tamil says the RBI may not stop at just 75 basis points of rate hike and keep on going for more. Moreover, he believes we should not celebrate victory too soon and wait for 18 to 24 months for the NPA situation to evolve. That's all for this week. We'll be back next Thursday at 11 with more banking news and analysis. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.